Welcome along to the uh, famous last session of the day. I know I'm between all of you and uh, the free drinks and the party afterwards, so I take that responsibility seriously and I, I endeavour not to be the last session going. Anyway, um, so this is a uh, session, um, I guess you could describe it as informational. You're probably, to be clear up front, you're probably not going to think of something in this session next time you're at work in a few days' time and think, oh, I need to drastically change my code. It's very much of a look at what goes on in the in the runtime under the hood, some of the .NET internals, and I'm always intrigued that people really seem to like this sort of stuff. But if that's not your thing, there is another talk you can go to. I just want to be clear up front. But this is definitely not a talk where you're going to, you know, back in the office on Monday, think oh, I'm going to drastically change all my code. Hopefully, it will give you more of an appreciation of the runtime, the .NET runtime we all run on top of and we use probably every day in our work. Um, but that's just to explain a bit of where things are going. Um, I should say um, I work for a company called Raygun, and I have loads of Raygun swag to give away. Please don't make me take it all back with me, so T-shirts, stickers, please come and speak to me afterwards um, if you want any of that. They're the company with the Raygun as their logo. Maybe you know them, and they do APM products and error reporting products that maybe some of you have used. But let's get this uh, out of the way up front. I, I really like, I love .NET internals. And, and for the recording, not love in the same way I love my wife and children. But this stuff really intrigues me. And I think it intrigues other people as well. Um, I, I blog about this sometimes. And as I said, I'm always surprised that people really want to dig into this stuff. Because actually, the promise of something like the .NET runtime, the CLR, is actually that we shouldn't have to worry about this. This, it does this stuff for us. It's there going on under the hood, the, the garbage collector and all the other stuff in, in the runtime. Um, and, and generally, you know, 99% of the time, it just does it and we don't need to care. But people seem to have this desire to know what's going on under the hood. Maybe it's part of being a software engineer, I don't know. But um, hopefully that's something you share. Uh, but to give a few more concrete reasons of why I think some of this stuff is important, part of it is just it's good to know. Um, but I think also that actually uh, it sums up a bit by this. So the idea of understanding one level below our usual abstraction. Now, I'm not going to stand here and argue that every single day your abstraction is directly on top of the runtime. But we all, as .NET developers, if that's what you are, use the .NET runtime in some way. Now, you might be at different levels in the stack. If most of your time is spent writing MVC or ASP.NET code, then you probably need to know more about the immediate one below you, which is ASP.NET. But sometimes we butt up against this, don't we? Maybe you've had problems with the garbage collector. Maybe you've had slow startup times. Maybe you get some strange exceptions. And sometimes you have to dig into some of these internals to work out what's going on. So I think part of it's that, is that actually um, it's good to have the general knowledge. Um, it's good to understand what we're running on top of, the .NET runtime. Um, I don't think it should just be just in the heads of the .NET runtime engineers at Microsoft who made all this. I think it's good that as a community, and I, at the end I'll list some other blogs of people who talk about this sort of stuff. I think it's good for the health of our community that we understand different things, and part of that is understanding the runtime. Another side I think that's important is actually when you get into high performance scenarios, you really need to know what the runtime's doing. If you want to care about performance to the level of, say, the Kestrel web server, have people heard of that? It's the uh, .NET web server, a guy from the community called Ben Adams and some people at Microsoft spend a lot of time optimizing it. Now, we're not all doing that every day, but sometimes we do run into those sorts of performance optimizations. And the, the amazing thing with the Kestrel is that it showed that a .NET-based uh, web server could compete in the tech in, power in power, tech in Power benchmarks. It was up there at the top after they'd done these optimizations. Now, if you go and look at the code they're writing in there, if you look at some of the pull requests that do these performance enhancements, basically you're very close to writing C and C++ code. It doesn't look like your standard C-sharp code. So that's always why the argument is don't optimize uh, prematurely, because you're writing often very unmaintainable code. But when they wrote that code to do particular optimizations, they weren't guessing that that code was going to be good code. They had deep knowledge of the just-in-time compiler, maybe, uh, deep knowledge of the garbage collector and when it's a good time to make sure the garbage collector doesn't have work to do, when it's a good time to uh, not allocate memory excessively. Um, so a lot of the time, we don't need to worry about that. But I think there's times where we butt up against these performance issues. And having an understanding of the runtime and it not being a mysterious black box is helpful. So I'm going to start with a bit of a demo. It's going to be the least impressive demo you see all day, but that is deliberate. So let's see. I'm never good at live demos. Let's see if I can get this right. Dot net run. Yes. OK, that's it. Now, you might see that. and Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. 
I failed in the simplest demo possible. That's, that's disgraceful. Right, that is quite embarrassing. Let's try that again. Okay, don't do live demos on stage. That's my notes. Uh, .NET run. Very underwhelming demo, yeah. <laughs> wow. Of all the things I thought I got wrong, not typing, not switching the screen around. Okay. <laughs> Other side from the ironic cheers. And um, the point of that is actually, when you see that, you, I don't know how many times people have written the Hello World, the classic Hello World. You know, you, even now in the .NET tooling, if you were in the talk this morning about getting to the core of .NET Core, he showed that that's the default. You know, it'll create that project for you. It's the st standard one that you encourage anyone to write, and it's sometimes the one that people beat C# -sharp with a stick because you've got to write about ten lines of code just to get Hello World on the screen. But anyway, that's another side of things. But the point is actually, even in that short amount of time there that that demo took to run, maybe two seconds aside from me getting it wrong, um, a lot happened. And the rest of the talk is going to try and delve into everything that happens from the point you type .NET run if you're in that tooling, the point you hit F5 in Visual Studio if you're doing it that way, launching the executable, however you might launch the executable till it prints something on the screen. Because actually, um, hopefully what I'll get across in this talk is there's a serious amount of stuff going on there. Um, and uh, is actually part of why uh, Hello World benchmarks look really bad in .NET. If you ever heard this, you know you shouldn't you shouldn't time the time it takes .NET to print Hello World to the screen because there's a lot of stuff the runtime does, and it kind of expects you to make use of that stuff. And if the thing you do is just exit and go away, you've wasted all that. So that's why a Hello World in, in .NET might take a bit longer than in other languages. So on to a bit of what's going on. This is the, what we're going to wor work through. So we're going to look at some of the main components in the runtime. Um, it helps understand how they're referred to. And there is different components in there. And sometimes knowing the names and, and what they all do is helpful. Um, and then we're going to go through the steps that were not obvious in that demo, but were, believe me, going on under the hood, hosting the runtime, how the CLR actually initializes and, and starts itself up, how the type loader has a job to do how JIT compilation plays a part, and then, at the end, a few other bits to tidy off. So that's what we're going to go through. And that is pretty much the order. A, bit, a few bits are in parallel, but generally, that's the order of things that go through. So first, on to the main components. Uh, you might be surprised about these numbers. I don't know. I was when I first looked into it. There's two and a half million, over two and a half million lines of code, source code, in the CLR repository. It's from about a year ago I did these stats, so it's, if anything, it's larger now, probably. Um, 8.2 million uh, lines of test code. There's a whole lot of tests in there to test the functionality of the runtime. Um, to explain, the core CLR repository is at github.com slash .net slash core CLR. There's also the core FX, which is often referred to as the base class libraries. Um, and we're going to distinguish between the two. So I'm just focusing on what's in the runtime. Clearly, aside from a simple hello world, there's not much you can do in the runtime without the core effects. But that's kind of a bit outside the focus of this talk. Um, so, uh, but just to understand, when we're talking these numbers here, this is just the core runtime. You can actually run the runtime standalone without core effects. It can basically print to the screen, and you can do reflection, and that's about it. You need core effects to do anything useful, including generic collections and all the other sort of stuff we take for granted. But it is possible to have a standalone runtime that runs without all of the other stuff. 24,000 lines of uh, files, of which 7,000 sources, a lot of tests. Um, most of the C-sharp code is in tests. There's very little C-sharp code that makes up the runtime. That's probably not a surprise. But there is components that runtime has written in C-sharp. Um, but the, the core of the runtime, MS Core Lib, basically, is all in C++. Um, there's some IL code, a bit of assembler code, because one of the things the runtime has to do is worry about different CPU architectures. So there's times when there's handwritten assembler code. Rather than relying on the JIT to emit certain types of code, they handwrite it for performance reasons, sometimes for efficiency reasons. Um, there's some Python code for scripting, and I have no idea what those Perl, co Perl, Perl code in there. But anyway, there's a little bit there tucked away. What it looks like as a picture is this is a heat map. Number of lines of code is the size of the box. This is the top level subfolders. And we're going to go through them all, so don't worry if you can't uh, make out all the writing or uh, understand all the words. But this is the folders as they are in the repository, so you can go and drill into them if you want to. Um, first of all, we start with MS CoreLib. This is the bit that is the C sharp code that supports the runtime, this brown, brownish box in the middle here. 
Um, so clearly, there's some things that the runtime exposes. One of the classic ones is uh, GC settings, GC control. There's certain APIs that the runtime exposes that need to be in C Sharp so we can use them. So that sort of code goes in there because it's so tied to the runtime. Also, there's certain fundamental types, strings, arrays, there's a few other things that have to exist. And there's often a, a dual duality. There'll be a C++ file and a C Sharp file. Strings are a classic example, there's two. Some of the code is in C Sharp, some of the code is in C++. They've moved various bits over the years, but there's uh, that representation of that type. And um, so, that, so, so all the C Sharp code is there in the middle. Reflection is also in the runtime. Technically, it doesn't have to be, but it's, I think, for historical reasons. But it makes sense. That's quite tied to the runtime. But it could be a separate library, and they're all talking about pulling that out. But generally, the rule for the C Sharp or the code that goes in the runtime is the runtime can't have a dependency on other code. It has to be self-contained. So anything the runtime needs to do its job has to be in there if it's C-sharp code. So if it exposes an API and it needs a generic collection, it has to live in there versus in CoreFX. CoreFX obviously depends on the runtime, but the runtime has to be standalone. So that's the C-sharp code. The, the corner down here is the just-in-time compiler, the purple section in the bottom. And uh, I was this is one of the bits I was surprised when I, dig, I dug into this, that it's so complex. I mean. When I think about it now, it is fairly obvious, but there's a lot going on there because the just-in-time compiler, it has the job of taking the IL code that we generally write in uh, you know, Visual Studio, whatever, that the Roslyn compiler um, emits. It takes that IL code and it has to convert that into something that can actually run on the CPU, can run on the machine that you're running on. And it has a, has a tough job because it has to run across multiple architectures, so that code looks different on ARM versus ARM64 versus, uh, sorry, AMD64, ARM32, whatever, it has to do a different job there. It also has to optimize that code, and it has to do pretty heavy duty optimizations. The C-sharp compiler, without being dismissive of it, the Rosalind compiler, doesn't do a lot of optimizations if you compile in release mode versus debug mode. There's some bits it does, but it leaves most of the optimizations to the just-in-time compiler, if we're talking about that model. And that's beneficial, actually, because that means that anything that writes to IL can, can benefit from the f compilation of the just-in-time compiler. And also, the just-in-time compiler has knowledge of the architecture. And so there's only so much that can be done in just the IL level. So all the complex optimizations, things like whether to inline methods or not inline methods, clever tricks around whether to uh, what type of code to emit, all that sort of stuff is done by the just-in-time compiler. And it's one of the key components in there and, and uh, very complex what's going on. Um, another part is the GC. Now, it's, uh, I'll, I'll show you this because you may not. Uh, Let's see if I can get this right this time. So let's look at some of this code to show code examples. Does anyone want to guess how many lines of code are in gc.cpp? Anyone guess? It's the entire .NET GC in one file. You're all looking to see if you can't see it. Any guesses? 10,000? Not quite. 20, oh, almost, almost. 30, 36,000 lines of code. Um, apparently, there's good historical reasons why it's one file. Um, mostly, it actually helps with portability. So the same GC is shared between lots of versions of the .NET runtime. In fact, I think it's shared between all the versions that Microsoft have produced, certainly. Um, but what it does, and you can sort of see it a bit here, is it has loads of these if defs, and you have basically settings, multiple heaps, whether you're running server, workstation. It all comes out of one file. Um, and there is one um, main developer whose day job is to <laughs> edit a 36,000 line uh, file of code. It's so big, if you go on GitHub, it will refuse to show the file. It says, this file's too big, I'm not showing this. But it's, um, anyway, so that most of that chunk there is one file. The GC is obviously another pretty complex part of the runtime when you think about what it has to do. If you've ever done C, C++ code where you have to worry about memory allocation, you're probably very grateful for the GC. But you just think about some of the things. It's running in the background. It's uh, dealing with um, memory. It's making sure it doesn't interrupt your program. It doesn't want to pause your program too much. It needs to compact memory. It needs to only clear up memory when it knows you've finished with it. All these sorts of things it has to worry about. It's quite a complex piece. On to another part that's a fairly large chunk. Don't worry too much about the names, although you might recognize SOS. But this is the part of the runtime that lets you debug, basically, in various different ways. So SOS is the plugin. If you've ever debugged .NET code through WinDBG, you have to type all those cryptic commands to load up SOS. 
And what that does is allow something that only understands native code to understand our .NET managed code. And there's a kind of bridge in between there where it has to map. And it, it tells it things like, what are the managed threads? What does a managed stack look like? The managed heap, all those concepts. Um, and on top of that, it's the part of the runtime that allows a debugger to attach. Um, when you debug through Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio is doing a bit, but it's mostly talking to the runtime via a kind of a data connection, and the runtime's doing all the tricky work of stepping through the code and knowing when to pause and all the other sort of stuff it has to take. So there's quite a lot of the runtime just dedicated to letting you debug. Um, the PAL, the platform um, adaption layer, is basically the bit of the runtime that lets the rest of the runtime not worry about which OS it's running on. It abstracts that all out, and then say the runtime itself needs to open a file, and that obviously looks different on whether it's on Linux or Windows or OS X, and this is clearly growing as .NET has become cross-platform. The runtime has to worry about more about the differences between different OSs. So there's a whole section there, and the basic idea is that the run everywhere else in the runtime can call one method, and this section of code deals with making that method uh, work across the different OSs. It's kind of the standard abstraction you might do if you're going OS, rather than having if def Windows, if def, Linux, whatever it might be throughout the spread throughout the rest of the code. Um, and the section in the middle is basically just header files, but that's significant because this is all the APIs that the runtime provides uh, for anything to use. So there's APIs around if anyone's ever worked on a, a third party debugger, third party profilers, all of these have published APIs that the .NET runtime makes available so that uh, third party tools can do those things. And the last section itself is the VM, the virtual machine, everything that's left over. And that contains a whole lot of other things. So we have the type system and generics, the ability to load our types that we create, classes, structs, all those sorts of things, and deal with that, make those methods uh, be able to be called at runtime, all the things that go on in a type system. And .NET runtime provides type safety. That's one of the main features of it that compared to other runtimes maybe, that you know you, you can't do things you're not supposed to, and part of that is providing that, you know, when you make a private method, aside from reaching through reflection, which you know you're on your own if you do that, it, it provides that sort of type safety. Um, there's rules around which types will load. And generics itself, um, compared to say the JVM, which did generics differently, there's a whole chunk of work that went in to make the runtime support generics. And again, we just do the nice uh, square brackets and put the type in and we kind of, you know, it does it for us, but there's a whole lot to make all that possible. Generic types and generic classes. Uh, all the built-in types, you know, the ones that we couldn't work without, string, array, and, and those two particularly, uh, all other collections are basically built on top of arrays. Having a fundamental data um, has to be provided by the runtime, uh, it has to be optimized by the runtime, the runtime has to know about it, the GC, all those sorts of things. And again, with a string, string's not a class you could write in C-sharp code, it's very much a special class that does some tricks to make it efficient and things like that, so that's something the, fr the runtime has to provide. Loading types and classes, threading. In the runtime, we have uh, not uh, not OS threads. They're runtime threads. They might uh, often line up, but there's a, an abstraction provided there, and all the work that goes into making that possible. Exception handling and stack walking. Were any of you in the the talk this morning? The one hour talk on except internals of exceptions. Yeah, fantastic. If you didn't see it, you can know from the fact there's a one hour talk about exceptions and a little bit on stack handling. There's a lot of complexity in there. And uh, again, it's kind of one of those things we almost take for granted. We write try, catch, and we just know that the magic's going to happen, but there's a whole lot. And, and that tends to be very CPU specific as well. So the runtime has to do a lot of work to make that possible. Um, other things as well, diagnostics, event tracing, profiling, the runtime provides all that so that we can, so a lot of third party tools can make use of that. And the runtime itself uh, sends out events saying what it's up to, what it's doing. And even things like p-invoke. Uh, .NET has quite a nice story of when you want to call out to native code from unmanaged to, uh, sorry, from managed to unmanaged. You know, we just put the DLL import attribute, but there's quite a lot of work that goes on there. So that's what's considered the virtual machine. But the .NET uh, code, when we run it, needs something to host it. The .NET uh, executable is not a native executable. And if you actually, in uh, Tamir's talk this morning, he talked about getting to the core of .NET Core and how this works. So when you run .NET run, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on there to make that possible. And it basically makes use of the hosting API. And you can go on uh, um, MSDN docs, and it will show you a really nice example. So um, in a second, I'll show a really quick demo of that. Um, but, but what it does is it uses the API. Um, it reaches into um, 
the iCLR runtime host 2. I assume there must have been a runtime host 1 instance at some point. Um, it starts up the runtime, prepares app domains. App domains are kind of hidden in, in the .NET core world. We don't get to use app domains, at least how we did before, but they still exist as a concept in the core of the runtime. There's at least one app domain going on there. Creates the app domain and runs the managed code. And um, we'll, uh, yeah, let's switch over to that. So you can uh, go on to the docs, and there's a, what is it, it's about 500 lines of code. I'm not gonna go through it all, but the main, the main things that it's doing is the runtime needs to be provided with what it calls is a um, trusted platform assemblies. And it's basically all the DLLs. So as I said, if you run the runtime core on its own, it doesn't do too much. There's not much in there. There's console and a few other bits. It needs to be provided with a whole other things. Um, but this just this uh, example mirrors the steps um, that we saw there. But if I run it up just to prove it does something, so you can see at the end, hello world, and it's picked up they're executing a DLL. So so generally you wouldn't want to. You know, it's nice as a sample, it's nice you can understand that there's a hosting API um, and something going on there. You generally don't need to write this. .NET run, the .NET CLI tooling handles it for you. If you're using ASP.NET inside of IES, that handles launching it. But it's just to be aware that, that there's something launching it. In, with .NET Framework and, and um, Windows, when it's built into the OS, uh, the, there's a little stub in the executable which knows to launch it, but it's doing the same process. So the hosting API. So one of the two, the two main bits of the hosting API that were highlighted in orange that we're going to talk through is the initialization of the runtime itself um, and then launching your code. So actually, uh, if you, like me, have nothing better to do for a couple of hours and want to count it, I counted it as the 68 things that the .NET runtime does before it runs a single line of your code. Um, but there's a whole lot going on there, and we're going to see that in a minute, a bit pictorially to understand that. But basically, the runtime has to initialize a whole lot of services. So some of the ones we've already talked about, like the just-in-time compiler, the garbage collector. Um, some of the more core, low-level pro, um, process ones, like the profiling API is debugging. Even if you're not debugging at that moment, you can attach a debugger later on, so it has to be ready for that. Um, it has to spin up app to, what, at least one app domain. Um, also, it has its own core components, like there's uh, error handling uh, inside the runtime so that it can translate those into exceptions that we use. Uh, part of what it does as well is start to allocate memory, and it has a, a memory pools, and it sets those up. It's basically getting everything ready. And you can see, um, I won't go into it now, but there's a single method in the runtime. that At the beginning of, the at the beginning of this method, nothing in the runtime is running. And at the end of this method, basically, it says, right, we're ready to go now. We can start executing code. So again, this is why if you do a Hello World, all this stuff is happening, ready for you to do a lot more. But if you do a Hello World program, this dominates some of the time. And it's part of why the complexity, or maybe those, you know, if you were to benchmark a Hello World in .NET, it'd be a bit slow. So initialize the CLR. So I'm gonna, in a moment, I'm going to show that in a different way. Has anyone heard of the tool Perfue? Keep your hand up if you've used Perfue. Okay, excellent. Okay, so after this, you've at least all heard of it. Maybe I haven't persuaded you to use it. You'll have to see in a moment what it looks like. The one issue with Perfue is often when people first look at it, they think, what on earth's going on here? And it takes a bit of uh, explaining. But it's a very powerful tool in that it can give you a very good um, indication of what's going on inside of the .NET runtime. It can do other things as well. It can help you profile your code. It can help you look at memory allocations in your code. And it's built on top of ETW events, which are events emitted by the runtime about what's going on, when there's a garbage collection, when the JIT just-in-time compiler does something. But I first need to explain something called flame grass. So again, anyone heard of flame grass before? Same people have used, maybe you've used it in Perfue. Okay, cool, so that's two things you hopefully have learned. Just as a really quick aside, uh, if you've not checked out Julia Evans's blog, JN, I don't know why I wrote it sideways, but anyway, jnvs.ca. She's most famous for writing these uh, zines, zines, which explain fairly uh, complex topics in a, in a pretty approachable way with the hand, hand drawn and stuff like that. It's worth checking out her blog if you haven't seen that and on Twitter. But the idea about um, flame grass and what I'm going to show in a second is that one of the things you can do in uh, Perfue is a call stack uh, 
um, profiler. So once every millisecond, it takes a call stack of what the runtime's doing, um, and it collates all those up. And the way it batches is worth explaining, because otherwise it's a, they're a bit confusing when you first come to them. So when you see a flame graph, it's not over time. It's not that it was doing this over here, then it moved on to this. It's, that's what it looks like for the whole elapsed period. So if, for instance, if you run Perfue for 10 seconds, it'll be taking a snapshot once every millisecond. At the end, it'll collate all those up. And what you'll get in this nice example here with the, the main at the bottom is obviously 100% of your samples are going to be in a main uh, call function. But as you work your way up the stack, then different, it'll spend a different amount of time in different parts of the code. And what it's saying in this example is that the main function called two separate functions. 40% of the time was spent in the panda function and 60% in the alligator function. And then within the alligator function, 20% of that time was spent in byte and 32% in T. So you sort of start at the bottom, and that's where everything is. And as you go up, you see the thinner traces. But it gives you a real nice picture of where the time was spent over that. So you can look at this example here and see that most of the time was spent in the alligator function. And then within that, you could see. So for, for that's where they're mostly used. So let's have a quick um, run up of Perfume. This is, uh, this is possibly why people get put off from Perfue. This is the main first screen. Um, this is not going to be an entire tutorial on Perfue. There is uh, lots of videos online, but just to show you one thing quickly. So um, the first thing you can do is run a command. And let's zoom this up. Um, again, this is why Perfue, it's not, to be fair, it's not a, um, a beginner's tool, I guess. You need to spend a bit of time finding your way around. But I do think that it's worthwhile if you do that. Um, but what we're going to do here is just look at CPU samples, and um, that we see here, and we're going to look at um, we're going to collect for 10 seconds. Uh, while I'm running the command, which is basically the hosting API I was looking at before, I'm going to run a, my Hello World app. So run a Hello World app, um, and it's going to go away. Where's the window gone? It spits out this rather cryptic log. You can see all the excitement going on there. This is the one problem with doing internal talks, is the demos don't look great, let's be fair. But we're getting there. Basically, what it's doing is collating all the samples, and it's doing a lot, spending a lot of time of finding the PDBs, because without those, it can't give decent stack traces with the right method names. That's what it's doing there. And at the end of it all, it zips it all up. OK, and what you end up with as we see here, is a data file. So let me do this. Ah, it's not being nice. It's also written in WPF, which maybe explains a few things. Um, and so you get a few different things. I'm not going to talk about all of them today, other than to tell you that one thing it can give you is a nice summary of your G the GC stats. So if you want to analyze a program and see, is it spending a lot of time? Is the GC doing a lot of work? And is that a problem? One way you can look at it is in Perfue, and the GC stats in there. Um, in the advanced group, we have things like JIT stats. So that's, again, another issue sometimes is the, the just-in-time compiler is spending a lot of time compiling methods. And that can hurt startup. So um, that's one thing it can tell you. But what we're going to focus on now is the more pretty part, which is CPU stacks. And we select our application. It doesn't trust my own machine. OK. This is what you're presented with, which even after being using Perfue for three years, this screen still confuses me. I have no idea what the ASCII art going on here is, what that's all about. If someone wants to explain that to me, I'd be grateful. But let's look at something that is more understandable, is the flame graph. Um, although, as I said, understandable. Uh, in theory, these are SVGs, and hopefully the one time will be a way to export. Um, and I'm not going to go through it all now, because it requires me hovering over. But if I go back to some ones that I prepared earlier, and we'll see a bit more, make a bit more sense of it. So you, so you end up with something like this and the wider bars. Um, but what it really is is this. This is the startup. Um, you have to believe me, this is the same as the one I ran this earlier on this afternoon to get it uh, in a way that's more easy to understand. But you can see roughly some of the places. So the EE startup on the right-hand side, that's the 
thing I just talked about a moment ago, the initialization, the 68 steps, however you want to describe it. That's that basically that method. And you might just be able to see the EE startup method in the call stack down the bottom. Also, there's the app domain setup. And app, the single app domain has to spin up. And then that's where it does some things like initialize static variables and a few other things going on per app domain. As I said, we don't really have that app domain separation in .NET Core. It's one of the things they took out. Um, but there is still one app domain that's the container for everything. Um, but the, the probably about a third, I guess, overall in this case was jitting and running the Hello World program, which um, makes sense. So again, just to prove the point that actually, you know, the, the Hello World code uh, probably was only, the, the time it spent Hello World code, running the Hello World code is very small. If you take out the time it had to jit that code and the time it had to set up the app domain and the time it had to set up the execution engine, it spends, in this contrived example of Hello World, it spends very little time executing your code. Obviously, in a longer program, you, pay, you um, get that benefit back over time, but in a short program, you're paying a lot of cost for that. Um, so that's the, uh, what it looks like in pictures, a bit easier to understand maybe. The other thing that it does is allocate memory. Um, so uh, memory for its own internal use, so all the things the runtime does need memory. The just-in-time compiler needs memory for its data structures. The runtime needs memory for its own data structures. It needs to hold data structures that describe your types, that describe your methods, so it knows what to do with them. Um, but probably the main one is the uh, garbage collector. And depending on whether your workstation or server, depending on how many CPUs and, and a few other things as well, it, it pre-allocates some heaps. We know them as you know, generation zero, generation one. Some of those are combined in one heap. There's a generation two heap. Um, but again, this is the uh, memory allocation up front. And uh, uh, it, will, it does this because one of the main things that the .NET GC provides is the ability that when you allocate, that's quick. So the, it wants to make sure that allocating, you know, when you allocate a string or array or something like that, uh, it, it's pre-allocated a heap, and basically it knows where the, the last allocation finished, and it jumps the pointer, you know, how many bytes you need. If you're allocating an array of 100 bytes, it'll jump it 100 bytes, and it'll then give that bit of memory to the code that allocated. That's simple. To make that possible, it has to pre-allocate some heaps up front, and it means that the complex part of the GC is clearing up afterwards. It has to go back through those heaps, work out when that memory is not being used. It does compaction to make sure the stuff that's being used is in one place and the free space is at the end. Um, but that's why it pre-allocates these heaps. It tries to do it um, in terms of pages that relate to the OS, and it tries to um, initialize the memory and only um, really pull it in uh, to the cache, if you like, when it's needed. But uh, you sometimes will see some of these uh, overhead when you run a simple application. You think, where's my memory going? One of the reasons is the .NET heap allocating a lot. But there's a lot of tools out there will show you that as well, so you can understand where that memory is going. Okay, on to a few other things. So, we probably all know that if we write code like this, the compiler is going to complain, right? We, one of the things you can't do in... in C sharp is instantiate in an abstract class, and there's a load of other things like this. You can't, you can't new up an interface. You can't call a private, you know, all this sort of stuff that the compiler uh, warns you about. Sorry, prevents you from doing. If if the compiler's happy, it'll emit some IL code, and then that'll get passed off to the runtime. It'll run it. But has anyone ever used any of the tools like IL DASM, IL ASM, or any other tool? Basically, anyone using those? Oh, a few people, yeah. So what you know you can do is you can take a, I mean, you can do it with um, Reflector uh, to look at the IL produced, but you can edit that, and you can edit it how you want. You know, those tools don't prevent you uh, doing things. So you could easily write some IL code that did something the compiler wouldn't let you do, basically. You could easily break. So the runtime can't rely on everyone being nice and just using a compiler that's... Um, that's uh, enforced only decent code. And I suppose there's even times when the compiler could actually emit invalid code and the runtime still needs to catch it. Because it needs to provide this type safety. If you could break some of these constraints, if you could start calling abstract classes, that means you can't rely on the state, uh, type system in the same way. And that's, that's a simple example, but there's a lot more examples of what the type uh, system provides. So basically, the runtime has to do a load of these checks when it loads a type to make sure none of these things have been, um, uh, none of the classes being loaded are invalid. And it gets even more complex than that because you can have classes that depend on each other. So uh, hopefully, no one's ever written code like this because it still confuses me every time I look at it. But the point is, is that class A is dependent on class B, and class B is dependent on class A. 
they're kind of uh, mutually, rec- no, I don't know, not mutually recursive, mutually dependent, that's the word. So what it means is class A shouldn't load if class B is invalid, and class B shouldn't load if class A is invalid. And it's a, I guess it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. How does it do that? Um, and what the runtime does is it, is it works through in a process like this. It loads every single class through levels. So they all start at the red top one at the top, which is basically r- loading in the DLL, in effect, loading in the raw data um, that describes the class from IL. And then it wor- works through. And you see it's doing things like looking at e- approximate parents, looking at exact parents, and looking at dependencies. And only once it's happy that for this type, its parents are all OK and its dependencies are all OK, does it then, the, the class loaded at the end is basically a, a switch, which is flipping a flag. At that point, it's happy that this class is OK, and the classes it depends on, and all the other classes, the same applies. So it works through these kind of steps. Um, and this is uh, mostly built out of, um, part of it has to uh, make possible the generic example I showed before. That's the classic example of why you have to do this. There's not many other ways you have types dependent on each other in that sort of mutual way. Um, but because of generics, again, it's the complexity of generics in the runtime. And it's a bit like uh, how databases commit transactions. And they work through steps. They do a few bits at a time. And only when they're happy that all the separate bits are, are OK do they then complete the transaction. It's the same sort of thing. So that's some of the stuff the runtime has to go through when loading a type. All of this stuff, at no point have we actually run any of our own code. That's the, <laughs> the runtime's gone through quite a lot of stuff before it even executes a single line of our code. Uh, leaving aside static initializers in, in um, classes, which are a bit of a separate thing. But generally, at this point, it's loaded everything up, and it's not actually executed any code. And you'll probably all know that the, the JIT compilation, just in time, the name comes from the fact that it doesn't com- JIT compile a method until that method is called, basically. Uh, leaving aside, say, things like NGEN, where you can do that all up front, the general way we run most of our code is that the just-in-time compilation. So when method A gets to the line that method A calls method B, at that point, method B will be JIT, JIT compiled. And if method B calls method C and so on, it's a kind of a cascading effect. And one of the problems with that is it, it can hurt startup time, because uh, the first time every single method is called, and particularly if method like if that chain continues, um, and maybe some of you have seen that in startup applications, and that's why things like NGEN and stuff were there to make sure that some of that is done beforehand, so it's not all relying on being done at runtime. Um, but this is a bit. Uh, this is what it looks like um, inside the runtime. It uses a kind of system of stubs. Stubs are kind of a fairly ubiquitous thing if you dive into the runtime, and what they are is a a little bit of assembly code, maybe two or three instructions. It's not really a method call. It's basically a jump. It's like it, the the execution goes over to the stub. The stub does a few things, and then it jumps over to the real method. And that happens in quite a lot of places. It's what powers virtual method calls, interface method calls. It's involved in generics. It's involved in some of the tricks the runtime does to make um, value types work. Um, when they're boxed, and there's a, there's a bunch of places it does it. It's a kind of ch- trick. Quite a lot of method calls will go through this unless they're a, uh, a direct one. But what it does is it, it puts this stub in the way, and basically when, the, when you first call a method, it goes via this stub, and this stub says, actually, this method hasn't been just in time compiled, and it goes off to the worker, which is, in effect, the, the JIT compiler, and that's where the work takes place. And then afterwards, what it's done is switched it around and we've lost the pre-stub part and the pre-stub worker, and now it points straight to the native code. And then the second time that method's called, it goes through actually what's called a stable entry point, and that basically says to the runtime, any time you call this method, go to this stable entry point, and it will do the, this is the, the permanent place you can do it from then onwards. Now, why is that interesting maybe in, in, in um, .NET Core? Because it's, for the first time in, in, the, in the .NET runtime, it's sort of changed. Has anyone heard of tiered compilation? In, in a few people, OK. So one thing that's changed in .NET Core is they've introduced something called tier compilation. And I alluded to it before. Part of the problem with JIT compilation is there's a delay, right? So the, the just-in-time compiler wants to do a really good job about optimizing your code. It would like to spend a long time. If you've ever, if you've ever done C or C++ code, where you have those compilers that are you know, everything's done at compile time. There's not the concept of just in time at runtime. Those compilers take a long, uh, longer. It's because they can. They can do lots of uh, really in-depth, crazy optimizations because um, 
the, the, you don't mind waiting a bit longer at build time. But the, the problem with the, the JIT compiler in .NET is it has to do this trade-off. It would like to uh, emit really efficient code, because if that method is going to be called thousands of times, it would like to be the most efficient version of that method, based on the CPU architecture, all, all other things it can do. But if it spends too long uh, compiling the method, then it kills startup time because of this cascading effect. And what tier compilation is put in for is to help this situation. Um, and, and it looks a bit different. So uh, the, the basic difference is it goes through another level of indirection if you see the normal one versus tier compilation. It has another stub. And this stub's job is to count how many methods time that method is called. So what tier compilation does the first time is it asks the JIT compiler to compile the method in the most simple way. No optimizations, nothing special. Just emit some code that is correct, obviously, and will execute, but don't spend, you know, spend as little time. It's called min-ops, min-optimization. And that's quicker. That's much quicker. It doesn't spend time doing all the analysis, because a lot of these optimizations need analysis. It needs to, you know, if it wants to inline, it needs to go and find the method to inline and put that in there. And there's a lot of work going along, and it needs to know that it can do the optimizations. So it goes through a pre-stub. And uh, the current version in .NET Core 2.1 is it's turned on, sorry, turned off by default, but you can turn it on with an environment variable. And I believe in .NET Core 3, it's going to be turned on by default. And the basic way it works is it counts how many times that method's called. Because a lot of the methods in our code may only be called a few times. If a method's only called a few times, it's probably not worth spending a lot of time optimizing it, because it, it's not worth it. If a method's called 10,000 times a second, or just 10,000 times in general, it's probably worth spending a lot of time optimizing it. So the, 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 the version at the moment, I believe it does a simple counter of 30. I imagine at some point there's going to be more complex um, analysis. But the basic idea is it works out, has this method been called enough for us to for it to be worthwhile for to have another go at optimizing it. Um, and then it does that. It puts it, in effect, on a queue, and it's all uh, asynchronous in the background. The just-in-time compiler then has another go with the maximum full optimization. It's asked to create the best version of that method, and that's swapped out. It keeps the old version around, because there's some scenarios where you might want to switch back to the old version for different things. Um, but it's, it's a flexibility that wasn't in the .NET runtime before. And this is the initial version, but over time, there's more and more things it can do. And it helps with things like generics. If you know in generics, there's code sharing and stuff like that. And there's other stuff it can do. So there's other scenarios down the line. Once it's got this mechanism of being able to compile a method for the second time. But if you look on the core CLR repository, you'll see they're doing a lot of performance work. And the thing that's making them not turn it on by default at the moment is because they don't want to regress performance because there's an extra level of indirection. Um, but the point is that actually it should help in a lot of applications with the startup time. And in theory, once they've released it, turned on by default, it's out of the box. We don't have to do anything to make this happen. It's one of those nice things that should just happen. OK, on to the final few bits to finish up, and then we can all go and use our drinks vouchers and uh, uh, see what the party is all about. So even uh, when we get to this point of printing uh, the JIT compilation, it's compiled our Hello World method, there's still a bit more to do. And most of that, in this example, is around calling out to the console. So the console, um, I talked about before, the platform adaption layer, that goes through that. It calls the underlying mechanism on the OS to actually write to the console. It doesn't do that in, in .NET. And part of the stuff, again, we see stubs here. Because when you're crossing from managed code to unmanaged code, it needs to, do, it needs to uh, marshal, it's called, arguments across. Maybe sometimes you've had to write DLL import, and you do marshal as if you have to tell it. It needs to convert from what, a, for instance, a string looks like in .NET to what a, a string looks like for the OS function. Um, and then when it comes back, it needs to check if there's an error. And it needs to convert that into a .NET exception or whatever it might be. It's also a level of protection to make sure that if something goes wrong in the um, unmanaged side, it doesn't affect, as far as it can protect it, the, the managed side. There's still always stuff, you, if you've ever done DLL import and stuff like that, there's ways you can really mess up .NET, but it tries as much as it can. So that goes through a level of indirection, and that's these stubs. Um, and you can sort of see the, the signature there is match uh, the, the, the underlying OS one. So the just-in-time compiler does all that. And so that's it. That is, uh, in a simple Hello World application, the end-to-end. Uh, -end. That's all the stuff the, the runtime does. Clearly, there's a few bits that if your program was going to run longer. I didn't really talk too much about the GC, but obviously, once you allocate enough memory, the GC kicks in. So there's some stuff that doesn't happen and doesn't show up in a Hello World program. But there's a lot of stuff going on just even in that simple example.
Um, if you're interested in any of this stuff, I blog about it, but there's lots of other people who do. So there's resources um, for, learning, uh, for learning about .NET internals. If you want to find out some of this stuff yourself, I'll put um, a few posts about how you can dig into the runtime, compile the runtime in certain ways so you can get extra diagnostics. There's tools I showed Perfue today. There's many other tools available that actually give you an insight into the runtime, as well as helping you know what's going on in your code. Um, presentations. And if you get anywhere into the .NET runtime, you'll probably come across this book of the runtime. Have people heard of this before? Anyone heard of this before? A few people? It's written for engineers on the .NET runtime team, but as part of open source and they've made it available. And it's a, a fantastic resource. Although I, I would say that it, it, it's not an introduction resource. Like ha about half my blog posts are me reading it, not understanding it, going away and figuring out what it's talking about and then coming back to it and understanding it a second time. So it's not an introductory resource, but there is a lot of uh, really good information. So that is it. I've uh, finished on time. Any questions about anything with the dot .NET? Yeah, I believe there's a microphone, maybe. Hi. Uh, I are there any plans to uh, introduce uh, bytecode interpretation prior to the jitting? Good question. Yeah, I, I, I asked the same thing. So no, there isn't. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the question was around interpretation. So in uh, the JVM hotspot, the first time, it doesn't even do a minimum min optimization. It actually interprets the code as IL. And the reason they, when I asked the same thing, when they, they said was basically there's no production-ready interpreter available in the .NET runtime to make that possible. So they weren't going to focus on that. I believe Mono's got a d an interpreter, and maybe that will make its way. But at the mo there is actually an interpreter hidden in the .NET runtime, and it's mostly for when, you're, when they port it to a new platform, it's for like bringing it up. So it's a simple one, but it's not production ready. So good question. Come to me afterwards. Thank you. I, have a, yeah. I have a book. Thanks. Anyone else want to ask a question? <laughs> I have one other book for another question. Does that incentivize anyone? No. <laughs> Any more? OK. So, uh, uh, how is it with tooling between uh, the old .NET framework and the new uh, .NET Core? Um, can I share the Perfue tools and uh, WinDebug? Yeah, good question. So, uh, your Perfue. So, I, I was actually running against .NET Core, uh, in effect, in, in that example there. So that yeah, Perfue works. Um, the bi the bigger problem probably is is the cross platform. So, for instance, if you take Perfue, that works great on Windows. I mean, you saw it, it's a, it's a WPF app, right? So, the the option at the moment for for Linux is run a perf collect, basically a script that collects some of that data on, on Linux, and then you can analyze it in Perfue in the UI on Windows. So that's kind of the, po the place it's at. So the low-level debugging, like uh, SOS, and some of the low-level tools had to be ported because the engineers themselves couldn't even run the runtime. But the more higher-level stuff is, is, is possibly not quite there. Um, so yeah, so Perfue, uh, in a roundabout way will work. But even when you run that script on Linux, it doesn't collect as much information because a lot of perfume from the, from the, it uses something called ETW, which is event tracing for Windows, and that's clearly a Windows only thing. So they're currently porting across. So one of the things they're doing is, uh, is looking at the cross-platform uh, around diagnostics and collection because it's, uh, it's not there yet. So it's, it, there's no straight answer. Some stuff does, some stuff doesn't. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you very much for coming along. The two people who ask questions there genuinely is a book. And if anyone else wants T-shirts or anything, I have some stuff to give away. So please come and come up.